The system was kicking off players as the load increased, trying to made room in memory and on the CPUs for whatever monster process was tearing through the frigid shipping containers. What the hell is going on, he said, shouting into the general din. Cadden was on the phone with ops, shouting at the system's administrators to get on it. Trace every process on the boxes, identify whatever species of strangler vine was loose in the machines, choking them to death. Bill, meanwhile, had set loose his special team of gray hat hackers to try and figure out if there were any of their black hat brethren loose on the systems, crackers who'd broken in to steal corporate secrets, amass virtual wealth, or simply crash the thing, either to benefit a competitor, seek ransom or simply destroy for the pleasure of destruction. Connor's money was on hackers. Each cluster was built and tested at Coke Games HQ in Austin, burned in for three solid weeks after it was all bolted into place in the shipping container. Once it had been green-lighted, it was loaded onto a flatbed truck and shipped to a data center somewhere cold, preferably near a geothermal vent. Tide farm or wind farm. There were plenty of sites in Newfoundland and Alaska, and some very good ones in Iceland and Norway, a few in Belgium and some in Siberia. The beauty of using standard shipping containers for their systems is that they were easy to ship, duh. The beauty of sticking the containers somewhere cold was that the main cost of running the systems was cooling off the machines as they relentlessly rubbed electrons against each other, bouncing them through the pinball machine guts of the chips within them. On a cold day when the wind was blowing, they could knock the cost of running one of those containers in half. Coke bought their data center slots in threes, keeping one empty. When a new container arrived, it was slotted into the empty bay, run for a week to make sure nothing had been hurt in transit, and then the oldest container in a coke slot was yanked, loaded back onto a train, or ship, or flatbed truck, and sent back to Austin, detouring at Mumbai or Shenzhen or Lagos to drop off the computers within, stripped by work crews who sent them off to the used server markets to be torn to pieces and salvaged. The containers were all specialized, only handling local traffic, to keep down network lag. But if one was overwhelmed, it could start off floating on its brothers around the planet, better to face a laggy play experience than to be knocked off altogether. It was inconceivable that every server on the planet would suddenly get a spike in players and hit capacity and not be able to offer some support to the others. Inconceivable, unless someone had sabotaged them. In the meantime, Connor had his feeds, his forensics, his gigantic haystacks and their hidden needles. Let the others worry about the downtime. He had bigger fish to fry. He plunged back in, writing ever more refined scripts to try to catch the bad guys. He had a growing file of suspects to look into in more depth, using another set of scripts and filters he'd been drafting in the back of his mind. He already knew how he'd do it. He'd build his files of bad guys, make it big and deep, follow them around the game, see who else they knew, get thousands and thousands of accounts and then destroy them. In one second, one instant. He'd delete every single one of their accounts, make their gold and elite items vanish, toss every single one out for terms of service violations. That part would be easy. The terms of service were so ridiculously strict and yet maddeningly vague that simply playing the game necessarily involved violating them. He'd obliterate them from game space and send them all back to their mommies crying. Thinking this kind of thing made him feel dirty and good at the same time. He was deep in meditation when a fat, hairy hand reached over his shoulder and slammed his laptop lid down so hard he heard the screen crack, and then the hand reversed its course and slapped him so hard in the back of the head that his face bounced off the table in front of him. Command Central fell perfectly silent as Connor straightened up, feeling and then tasting the blood pouring out of his nose. His ears were ringing. He turned his head slowly, because his eyes wouldn't focus properly and his head felt like it was barely attached to his neck. Standing over him, snorting like freight engine, stood Cadden, the head of ops, wearing a two-day beard and smelling of rancid sweat. What? The man drew back his beefy fist again, cocking it for another blow to Connor's head and Connor flinched away involuntarily. He hadn't been in a fight since his schoolyard days, and he couldn't believe that this actual adult man had actually hit him with his actual fists. Something was growing in his chest, bubbling over, headed into his arms and legs. His breath came in short pants. Every inhale bringing blood into his mouth. His heart thudded. He stood up abruptly, knocking his chair over backwards and, leapt. 
he pushed off with both legs, throwing his own considerable bulk into Caden's huge, protruding midsection. It was like a medicine ball, hard and unyielding, and he rebounded off it. Just as Caden's fist clobbered him again, getting him with a hard hammer blow in the back of the neck that knocked him to the ground. He hit the ground with a thud that he felt in every bone in his body, his head caroming off a table leg. He got his palms underneath him and shot to his feet again, coming all the way up, bringing his knee up into Caden's balls as he did, doubling the fat man over. His hands were already in awkward fists and it was natural as anything to begin to beat the man's head with them, hitting so hard the skin over his knuckles split. It had only taken a few seconds, and now the rest of Command Central reacted. Big hands grabbed his arms, waist, legs, pulled him away. Across from him, four game runners had Cadden pinned as well, shouting at him to calm down. Just calm the hell down, all right. He did, a little. Someone handed Connor a wad of pizza parlor napkins to press against his nose and someone else handed him an ice-cold can of coke from the huge cooler at the side of the room to press against his aching neck. What the hell is wrong with you, he choked, glaring at Cadden, still held fast by four beefy game runners. You goddamned idiot. You brought down the whole goddamned network. You and your stupid scripts. Do you have any idea how much you've cost us with your little fishing expedition? Connor's anger and shock morphed into fear. What are you talking about? Whoever wrote those damned forensics programs didn't have a clue. They clobbered the servers so hard, taking priority over every other job, until the system had to kick all the players off the games so that it could tell you what they were doing. I'll tell you what they were doing. Connor, they were trying to connect to the server. Connor shot a look at Bill, who had written the scripts, and saw that the head of security had gone pale. Connor dimly remembered him saying that the scripts were experimental and to use them sparingly, but they had been so rewarding, it had given him such a thrill to sit like a recording angel over the worlds, like Santa Claus detecting everyone who was naughty and everyone who'd been nice. The enormity of what he'd done hit him almost as hard as Caden's fist had. He had shut down three of the twenty largest economies in the world for a period of hours. Coke ran games that turned over more money than Portugal. Poland or Peru. That was just the peas. If Coke's games had been real countries, it would have been an act of war, or treason. It was easily the biggest screw-up of his career. Of his life. Possibly the biggest screw-up in the entire history of the Coca-Cola Corporation. Command Central seemed to recede, as if the room was rushing away from him. Distantly, he heard the game runners hiss explanations to one another, explaining the magnitude of his all-encompassing legendary world-beating fail. Connor had never had a failure like this before. He'd screwed up here and there on the way. But he'd never, ever, never, never. He shook his head. The hands restraining him loosened. Stiffly, he bent to pick up his laptop. Slivers of plastic and glass rained down as he lifted it. He couldn't meet anyone's eyes as he let himself out of the room. He wasn't sure how he'd gotten home. His car was in the driveway, so that implied that he'd driven himself, but he had no recollection of doing so. And here he was, sitting at his dining room table, grand and dusty, he ate his meals over the sink when he bothered to eat at home at all, and his phone was ringing from a long way off. Absently, he patted himself down. Noticing as he did that he was holding his car keys, which bolstered his hypothesis that he had driven himself home. He found his phone and answered it. Connor, Ira said. Connor. I don't know how to tell you this. Dash quote dot. Connor grunted. These were words you never wanted to hear from your broker. Connor are you there? He grunted again. Somewhere, his brain was finding some space in which to be even more alarmed. Connor, listen. Are you listening? Connor. It's like this. Mushroom Kingdom gold is collapsing, falling through the floor. There's no bottom in sight. Oh, Connor said. It came out in a breathless squeak. The broker sighed. He sounded half hysterical. It's worse than that, though. That prince in Dubai. Turns out he was writing paper that he couldn't honor. He's broke, too. He is, Connor said. A million miles away, a furious gorilla was baring its teeth and beating its hairy fists against the insides of his skull, screeching something that sounded like you said it was risk-free. He isn't saying so, of course. Now the broker sounded more than half hysterical. He giggled, a laugh that ran up and down several octaves like a drunk sliding his fingers up and down a piano's keyboard, he's saying things like. 
We are experiencing temporary cash flow difficulties that have caused us to defer on some of our financial obligations due to overall instability in the market, but Connor. Dash quote. He giggled again. I've been around the block. I know what financial BS sounds like. The prince is B-R-O-K-E. He is, Connor said. You said it was risk-free. You said it was risk-free. And there's something else. Connor made a tiny sound like a whimper. The broker plunged on. This is my last day at Paglia and Kennedy. Actually, this may be Paglia and Kennedy's last day. We just got our notices. Paglia and Kennedy sank a lot of money into these bonds and their derivatives. Everyone else ran off to steal some office supplies but I thought I would stand here on the deck of the Titanic and make some phone calls to my best clients. I put nearly everything into Mushroom Kingdom Gold. Not at first, you understand. But over time, bit by bit, the returns were just so good. Dash quote dot. It was risk-free, Connor said, louder than he'd planned to. Yeah, Ira said. Okay, Connor, buddy. Okay. I have other calls to make, Connor could tell the poor guy expected him to be grateful. He thought he was making up for costing Connor, how much? 180,000. 200,000. Connor didn't even know anymore. Thanks for calling, he said. Thanks. Ira. Take care of yourself. He could barely choke the words out, but once he had, he actually felt a little better. He hung up the phone and dropped it on the table, letting it clatter. Somewhere out there. Coke's game worlds were flickering back to life, players logging in again, along with gold farmers. Webleys. Pinkertons, the whole crew. Not Connor, though. Connor had lived in a game world of one kind or another since he was seven years old, and now he was willing to believe that he'd never visit one again. Any second now, he would be fired, he was quite sure. And maybe arrested. And he was broke. Worse than broke, he'd bought the last round of securities from Paglia and Kennedy on margin, on borrowed money, and he owed it back. Though with the brokerage going under they may never come and ask for it. He drew in a deep breath and closed his eyes. Some smell, the sweat that soaked his shirt, the blood that caked his face, the musty smell of the house, triggered a strong memory of his place in Palo Alto, near the Stanford campus, and the long, long time he'd spent there, buying virtual assets, teetering on the brink of financial ruin and even starvation. And just like that, he was free. Free of the terror of losing his job. Free of the terror of being broke. Free of the rage at the gold farmers. Free of the shouting, roiling anger that was command central and free, finally free of his fingerspitzenchful. The world was tumbling free and uncontrolled and there wasn't a single thing he could do about it and wasn't that fine. There was an old song that went freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose and Connor suddenly understood what it all meant. When he was eight years old. He'd decided to work on video games. It was one of those ridiculous kid things, like deciding to be an astronaut or a ballerina or a cowboy or a deep sea diver. Most kids outgrow their dreams, go on to do something normal and boring. But Connor had held on to it, finding his way into game space through the most curious of means, and he had trapped himself there. Until today. Now the eight-year-old who'd sent him on a quest had finally released him from it. He took a shower and iced his nose some more and put on a t-shirt and a pair of baggy shorts he'd bought on holiday in the Bahamas the year before. He'd spent most of the trip in his room, online, logged into GameSpace, keeping the fingerspitzenchful alive, and opened his door. Outside it was Atlanta. He'd lived in the city for seven years, gone to its movie theaters and eaten at its restaurants, taken his parents around to its tourist sites when they visited, but he had never really lived there. It was like he'd been on an extended seven-year visit. He kicked on a pair of flip-flops he normally wore when he had to go outside to get the mail and stepped out his door. He walked into the baking afternoon sun of Atlanta, breathing in the humid air that was so wet it seemed like it might condense on the roof of his mouth and drip onto his tongue. He got to the end of his walk and looked up and down the street he'd lived on for all these years, with its giant houses and spreading trees and disused basketball hoops and he started walking. No one except maids and gardeners walked anywhere in this neighborhood. Connor couldn't understand why. The spreading trees smelled great. There were birds singing. Even a snail inching its way across the sidewalk. In half an hour, Connor saw more interesting new things than he had in a month. Oh, the feeling of it all. A lightness in his head, an openness in his chest. 
Old pains in his back and shoulders that had been there so long he'd forgotten about them disappeared, leaving behind a comfortable feeling as striking as the quiet after a refrigerator's compressor shuts off, leaving behind unexpected silence. He was sweating freely, but he didn't mind. It just made the occasional breath of wind feel that much better. Eventually, his bladder demanded that he head home, so he ambled back, waving at the suspicious neighbors who peered at him from between the curtains of their vast living room windows. As he opened his door, he heard his phone ringing. A momentary feeling of worry arced from his throat to his balls, like a streak of lightning, but he forced himself to relax again and headed for the bathroom. Whomever was calling would leave a message. There, the voicemail had picked it up. He had to pee. He peed. The phone started ringing again. He went into the kitchen and rummaged in his freezer. There was a loaf of brown bread there, he never could get through a whole loaf before it went moldy, so now he bought a dozen loaves at a time and froze them. He chipped off two slices and put them in the toaster. There was peanut butter from the health food store. Crunchy style, with nothing added. While the bread was toasting, he stirred the peanut butter with a knife, mixing the oil that was floating on top with the ground peanuts below. He had honey, but it had crystallized. No problem, 20 seconds in the microwave and it was liquid again. What he really wanted was bananas, but there weren't any, the phone was ringing again, and he was hungry and wanted a sandwich now. He'd get bananas later. The sandwich was, the phone was ringing again, delicious. He needed fresh bread though. He'd get some of that when he picked up the bananas. Throw out the frozen, there it was again, bread. He'd eat fresh from now on, and relish, and again, every bite. Up until the moment that his finger pressed the green button, he believed that he was going to switch his phone off. But his finger came down on the green button and the anxiety sizzled up his arm and spread out from his shoulder to his whole body as the distant voice from the phone's earpiece said. Hello. Connor. Connor watched as his hand wrapped itself around his phone and lifted it to his ear. Yes, his mouth said, in the old. Tight Connor voice. It's Bill, the head of security said. Can you come into the office? Connor heaved a sigh. I'll courier over my badge. You can pack up my desk and ship it back. If you want to sue me, you'll have to hire a process server and have him come out here. Bill's laugh was bitter and mirthless. We're not suing you. Connor, we're not firing you. We need your help. Connor swallowed. This was the one thing he hadn't anticipated, that his life might come back and suck him into it again. What the hell are you talking about? We think it's your gold farmers, Bill said. They've got us by the balls, and they're squeezing. Connor changed into his work clothes like a condemned man dressing for his own hanging. He prayed that his car wouldn't start, but it was a new car, he bought a new one every year, just like everyone else in Command Central, and its electric motor hummed to life as he eyeballed the retina scanner in the sun visor. He drove down his street again, seeing it all through the smoked glass of his car, the rolled-up windows and air conditioning drowning out the birdsong and shutting out the smells of the trees and the nodding flowers. Too fast to spot a snail or a bird. He headed back to work. Hash. They came for Big Sister Nor and the Mighty Krang and Just Bob in the dead of night, and this time they brought the police. The three of them watched the police break down the door, accompanied by a pair of sour Chinese men with the look of mainland gangsters, the kind who came to Singapore on easy two-week tourist visas. Noor and her friends watched the door be broken down from two lorongs, side streets, down, using a webcam and streaming the video live to the Webley's network and a bunch of journalists they'd woken up as soon as they'd bugged out of the old place, warned by a sympathetic grocer at the top of Galing Road. The fallback house wasn't nearly as nice as the one they'd vacated. Naturally, but the two quickly came into balance as the police methodically smashed every piece of furniture in the place to splinters. The mighty Krang drew real-time annotations on the screen as the police worked, sometimes writing in the dollar value of the furniture being smashed, sometimes just drawing mustaches and eye patches on the police in the video. When the Chinese men took out their dicks and began to piss on the wreckage, he leapt to his trackpad. Circled the members in question. Drew arrows pointing to them, and wrote tiny, in three languages before they'd finished. They watched as one of the policemen answered his phone, listened in as he said. Hello, and, what, and, where, and then, here, here, feeling around the place where the wall met the ceiling, until he found the video camera. The look on his face, a mixture of horror and fury, as he disconnected it was priceless. Priceless. 
the mighty Krang said, and turned to his companions, who were far less amused than he was. Oh, do lighten up, he said. They didn't catch us. The strikers are striking. Mumbai and Guangdong are going crazy. The New York Times is sending us about 10 emails a minute. The Financial Times, too. And the Times of London. That's just the English papers. Germans. French. And the Times of India, of course. They've got a reporter in Dharavi, and so do the Mumbai tabloids. We're six of the top 20 YouTube videos. I've got. He looked down, moused some, 82.361 emails from people to the membership address. Just Bob glowered at him with her good eye. Matthew is trapped in Dauphin. 42 are dead. We don't know where Gia and the white boy. Wei Dong, R. Big sister Noor reached out her hands and they each took one of hers. Comrades, she said. Comrades. This is the moment, the one we planned for. We've been hurt. Our friends have been hurt. More will be hurt when this is over. But people like us get hurt every single day. We get caught in machines, we inhale poison vapors, we are beaten or drugged or raped. Don't forget that. Don't forget what we go through, what we've been through. We're going to fight this battle with everything we have, and we will probably lose. But then we will fight it again, and we will lose a little less, for this battle will win us many supporters. And then we'll lose again. And again. And we will fight on. Because as hard as it is to win by fighting, it's impossible to win by doing nothing. An alert popped up on Krang's screen, reminding him to switch a new prepaid SIM card into his mobile phone. A second later, the same alert came up on Big Sister Noor and Just Bob's screens. Big Sister Noor smiled. Okay, she said. Back to work. They swapped SIMs, pulling new ones out of dated envelopes they carried in money belts under their clothes. They powered up their phones. Both Just Bob and the Mighty Krang's phones rang as soon as they powered up. The Mighty Krang looked down at the number. It's Wei Dong, he said. Told you he was safe. Just Bob looked at her phone. Ashok, she said. They both answered their phones. Hash. Ashok knew that this time would come. For months. He'd slaved over models of economic destruction, how much investment in junk game securities would it take to put the game runners into a position of total vulnerability. He'd modeled it a thousand ways. Tried many variables in his equations, sweated over it, woken in the night to pace or ride his motorcycle around until the doubts left his mind. Somewhere out there, some distant follower of Big Sister Noor's had convinced the mechanical Turks to go to work selling his funny securities. It had been easy enough to package them, there were so many companies that would let you roll your own custom security packages together and market them, and all it took was to figure out which one was most lax with its verification procedures and create an account there and invent a ton of virtual wealth through it. Then he logged into less sloppy competitors and repackaged the junk he'd created, making something that seemed a little more legit. Working his way up the food chain. He'd gone from packager to packager, steadily accumulating a shellac of respectability over top of his financial turds. Once they had acquired this sheen, brokers came hunting for his funny money. And since the Webleys were diverting a sizable chunk of game wealth into the underlying pool, he was able to make everything seem as though it was growing at breakneck speed, and it was. After all, all those traders swapping the derivatives were driving up the prices every time they completed a sale. Once, at about two in the morning, as Ashok watched the trading proceed, he realized that he could simply quit the Webleys, sell the latest batch of funny money, and retire. But he was never tempted. He'd always known that it was possible to get rich by trampling on the people around you, by treating them as suckers to be ripped off. He couldn't do it. Of course, here he was. Doing it, but this was different. His little financial game could end well if all went according to plan, and now it was time to see if the plan would go the way it was supposed to. Just Bob took his call in her fractured English, which was better than her Hindi, limited as it was to orders of battle and military cursing. He told her that he needed to speak to Big Sister Noor. And she asked him to wait a moment, as BSN was on the phone with someone else at the time. In the background, he heard Big Sister Noor conversing in a mix of Chinese and English, flipping back and forth in a way that reminded him of his buddies at university and the way they'd have fun mixing up English and Hindi words, turning out puns and obscurely dirty phrases that nevertheless sounded innocent. He looked at the clock in the corner of his screen. It was 5 a.m. and outside, he could hear the birds singing. 
In the next room, Mullah's army fought on in tireless shifts, defending the strike. They slept in shifts on the floor now, and there were 50 or 60 steel and garment workers prowling the street out front, visiting other striking sites around Dharavi with sign-up sheets. Trying to organize the workers of little five- or ten-person shops into their unions. He realized he was falling asleep. How long had it been since he'd last slept for more than an hour or so? Days. He jerked his head up and forced his eyes open and there was Yasmin before him. Raccoon eyed beneath the hijab across her forehead. She was frowning, her mouth bracketed by deep worry lines, another one above the bridge of her nose. She was holding her lathi. Yasmin, he said. She bit her lip. Mala is gone, she said. No one's seen her for hours. Twelve, maybe fourteen. He started to say something but then big sister nor spoke on the phone. Ashok, sorry to keep you waiting. He looked to Yasmin, then back at his screen. One second, he said to the phone. Yasmin, she's probably gone home to sleep. Dash quote dot. Yasmin shook her head once, emphatically. He felt a jolt of fear. Ashok, big sister Noor's voice in his ear. Come in, he said to Yasmin. Come here. Close the door. He stood up and held his chair out to Yasmin and dropped into a squat beside her, heels on the ground. He pressed the speaker button on the phone. Noor, he said. He always felt faintly ridiculous calling this woman, Big Sister, though the Webleys seemed to relish it in the same way they loved saying General Robotwala. I have Yasmin with me here. She tells me that Mala is missing, has been missing for some hours. There was a momentary pause. Ashok, Nor said. That's terrible news. But I thought you were calling about the other thing. Dash quote dot. He looked at Yasmin, whose eyes were steady on him. He never talked about the work he did for Big Sister nor, but everyone knew he was up to something back here. Yes, he said. The other thing. I need to talk to you about that. But Yasmin is here and she tells me that Mala is missing. Big Sister nor seemed to hear the gravity in his voice. She took a deep breath, spoke in a patient voice. You know Dharavi better than I do. What do you think has happened? He nodded to Yasmin. I think that Banerjee has her, she said. I think that he will hurt her, if he hasn't already. From the phone. The mighty Krang's voice broke in. I have Banerjee's phone number, he said. From one of our people in Guzan. He emailed us a list of everyone in his boss's address book. Ashok found his hands were in fists. He'd only met Banerjee once, but that was enough. The man looked like he was capable of anything, one of those aliens who could look at a fellow human being as nothing more than an opportunity to make money. Yasmin's eyes were wide. You want to phone him? Sure. The mighty Krang sounded calm. Even flippant. Just as he did in the inspirational videos he posted to the Webbly boards and YouTube. It's worth a try. Maybe he wants to ransom her. Are you joking? The light tone left his voice. No Yasmin. I'm not joking. Look, the Webleys are powerful. Men like Banerjee understand that. Once I got Banerjee's number. I used it to get a full workup on him. We have some leverage over him. It's possible that we can make him see reason. And if we can't. Dash quote. He trailed off. We're no worse off than before, big sister nor finished. When will we call him? Oh, now would be good. Negotiations are always best in the small hours. Hang on. I'll get the number. The mighty Krang typed some. Okay, let's do this. Okay, Yasmin said in a tiny voice. Okay, Ashok said. I'll keep you two muted for him, but live for me. Remember that, if you talk over him. I'll hear both, which might confuse me. We'll mute our end. Ashok said. He saw that his battery was low and fished around on his desk for a power cable and plugged it in. Then he muted the phone. He and Yasmin unconsciously leaned their heads together over it. So that he could smell his sour breath and hers, which smelled of vomit. She had been sick. He closed his eyes and it felt as though there was sandpaper on the insides of his eyelids. After a few rings, a sleepy voice mumbled, Victory to Rama, in Hindi, the traditional phone salutation. It made Ashok snort derisively.